Catherine Labore, Saint of the Miraculous Medal, Part 2. The Miraculous Medal. By November of 1830, the unrest in Paris was over, and Louis Philippe had taken the throne. On November 27th, eve of the first Sunday of Advent, Catherine was in the chapel with the other sisters for evening meditation when she again heard the swish of a silk dress. Looking up, she saw a vision of the Queen of Heaven, dressed all in white, standing on a globe and holding a golden ball in her hands. Her fingers were covered with rings whose stones sparkled with brilliant light that poured from them all the way down to her feet. She was radiant in all her perfect beauty, as Catherine later described it. Catherine heard the words, The ball which you see represents the whole world, especially France, and each person in particular. These rays symbolize the graces I shed upon those who ask for them. The gems from which rays do not fall are the graces for which souls forget to ask. Then the vision changed. The ball vanished, and Mary's arms swept downward, the rays cascading to the globe on which she still stood, her foot crushing the head of a serpent. The globe had the year 1830 inscribed upon it. The Virgin wore a blue mantle over a white dress, with a white veil draped back over her shoulders. An oval formed around the vision like a frame, and written in gold letters within it were the words, O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. The voice said, Have a medal struck after this model. All who wear it will receive great graces. They should wear it around the neck. The apparition reversed, and Catherine saw a large M surmounted by a bar and a cross, with the hearts of Jesus and Mary beneath it. One was crowned with thorns, the other pierced by a sword, symbolic of the prophecy of Simeon, when he told Mary, A sword shall pierce your own heart, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Luke 2, verse 35 Twelve stars encircled the whole thing. The vision then faded, but would be repeated five more times over the next year. Catherine told Father Alladell about the latest apparitions and the request to have a medal struck. As with her other visions, he didn't accord it much importance. Each time the vision was repeated, poor Catherine was compelled once again to approach Father Alladell about it. These were extremely unpleasant encounters for Catherine, often involving verbal battles between her and Father Alladell. The other sisters would see Catherine approach the confessional trembling with fear, then hear the sound of raised voices issuing from within. Although Catherine was never disobedient or rebellious, and would cease the discussion at Father Alladell's order, she was not to be dissuaded from the mission she believed God had entrusted to her. While honoring her vow of obedience, she nonetheless possessed a strong will and a spirited tongue, and doggedly pursued her mission. There is no doubt that, as Our Lady had warned, Catherine suffered much during this period, even to the extent of telling the Virgin that she had better appear to someone else, since no one will believe me. Only Our Lady's promise of God's grace sustained Catherine, and made it possible for her to persevere. In fairness to Father Alladell, his was not an easy task either. He needed to determine if Sister Catherine's visions were genuine, and whether it would be prudent to act on them. But eventually, as he came to know Catherine better, he realized that by her very nature, it was unlikely that she was inventing it all. He knew that she was good and pious, and he did not doubt the sincerity of her belief that she had seen these things. He also realized that, of herself, she did not possess the intellectual ability nor the imagination to fabricate such a story with all its lavish detail. 
Then, too, was the fact that her reported prophecies had indeed come true. Furthermore, he had given his promise to Catherine early on that her identity not be revealed, which placed all the responsibility for carrying out Heaven's orders on his shoulders alone. Meanwhile, the end of Catherine's novitiate was fast approaching, when she could possibly be assigned to a faraway post. Somehow, Father Alladell managed to use his influence to ensure that Catherine was assigned to the Hospice Dongyan at Ruyi, where he was the regular confessor. This, of course, was necessary because of his role as Catherine's spiritual advisor in the matter of her visions. The hospice had been founded as a retirement home for the old men who, in earlier years, had served the royal family. Sister Catherine's duty would now be to care for these aged residents. Shortly after her arrival at Angyun, while visiting the chapel at the mother house, Catherine saw Our Lady again. The apparition took the same form as it had on November 27th, but on this occasion, Our Lady informed Catherine, You will see me no more, but you will hear my voice in your prayers. In the following weeks, during her prayers, Catherine heard the frequent urging of Our Lady that the medal be struck. When Catherine complained that Father Alladell did not believe her, Our Lady replied, Never mind. He is my servant and would fear to displease me. No doubt it was these words reported back to Father Allardell that finally spurred him to action. His love for Mary and his fear of angering her overcame the lingering doubts he had about Catherine's visions. Indeed, Our Lady seemed to have great confidence in him, as he also would later be spiritual advisor to Sister Justine Biskiburu, to whom the green scapula was manifested in 1840 and would be responsible for its production and distribution. In January 1832, his good friend, Father Etienne, had an appointment with Archbishop de Quelin and asked Father Alladel to accompany him. After Father Etienne's meeting, Father Alladel took this opportunity to tell the Archbishop about the visions and Our Lady's request for a medal. After much careful questioning, the Archbishop, who was especially devoted to the Immaculate Conception, consented. On June 30, 1832, the first 2,000 medals of the Immaculate Conception were delivered. Catherine, upon receiving her share of medals, said, Now it must be propagated. She was to keep a few of these first medals until the end of her life. One of them can be seen at the Miraculous Medal Art Museum in Germantown, Pennsylvania. As the saying goes, the rest is history. The medal's rapid spread throughout France and the world, and its astonishing impact as a sacramental, was rivaled only by the rosary. So many healings, conversions, and wonders sprang from it that it soon became known as the Miraculous Medal. Catherine's great mission was accomplished, and the ecstasy of the heavenly visions, as well as the despair and frustration of trying to convince Father Alladell to act on them, was over. Now Catherine would embark on the final and longest phase of her earthly journey, the hidden life of obscurity, as she settled into the ordinary routine that was to be her destiny for 46 years. Catherine's Hidden Life and Final Years on Earth The visionaries who followed Catherine Labore into the Marian Age would be at the center of the attention surrounding the phenomena of their apparitions. For example, St. Bernadette of Lourdes and the Three Children of Fatima. But not Catherine. She adamantly insisted to Father Allardell that Our Lady had told her to speak only to her confessor about the visions. Catherine would not budge from this position for 46 years. We can well imagine the sense of excitement and intrigue in the convent when the news leaked out that one of the sisters had been privileged to see the Blessed Virgin. The endless conjecture, the sly questions intended to unearth the seer in their midst, could well have tripped up Catherine 
but she was more than equal to the task of protecting her secret. Over time, she became quite adept at deflecting suspicion and probably even enjoyed this challenge to her cleverness and wit. There is no doubt that the humility, discretion, and courage it took for Catherine to keep her secret until shortly before her death in 1876 were of such a heroic nature that it remains one of the most significant acts of her life. She truly is a role model for those who lead hidden but fruitful lives in God's service. At Catherine's beatification service, Pope Pius XI said with dry humor, to think of keeping a secret for 46 years. Not that Catherine adopted a standoffish attitude to protect herself. Quite the contrary. Although she had a quiet nature, she was lively and even merry as a novice, spending many happy hours with the other sisters during recreation. There's little doubt, however, that keeping her secret was the right thing for her particular soul, as she was shy and did not like the limelight. For her, obscurity was the road to sanctity. She knew she was only an instrument of God's grace, and that her visions were a gift to the world and not for herself alone. Catherine's life in the years after the great apparitions of 1830 is beautifully summarized in the words of her dear friend, Sister Sejala. Later on, when they speak of her who saw the Blessed Virgin, you will be happy to have known this beautiful soul, living such an ordinary life and keeping herself hidden behind her duties. Like all of us, Catherine had her own particular faults to overcome. Throughout her life, she was given to flashes of temper and a sharp tongue. She also had a very strong will, which is obvious in the way she overcame so many obstacles in the early years of her life. But once the mission of the medal was accomplished, Catherine's life took on a different tone. Now she had to live in complete submission to her superiors, who were sometimes unreasonable, even wrong in their judgment. Yet, because of her vow of obedience, Catherine had to conquer her natural impulse to do things her own way. For instance, although Catherine had been the very competent mistress of her father's household from a young age, she was now often forced to accept a superior's way of doing things, despite the fact that Catherine was far more capable than her superiors of the task at hand. Having strong ideas herself about how things should be done, she often found it difficult being contradicted. But she rose above this by developing the virtues of patience and humility to the extent that she was able to graciously defer to the other sister and be charitable to her above and beyond what was required. Although Catherine took her vow of poverty so seriously that upon her death the sister servant was shocked to find so few belongings in Catherine's possession, she was generous in her consideration of others. One day, she saw a sister return from laundry duty with her habit soaking wet. Concerned that the sister should not become chilled, Catherine went hastily to the superior to get some warm flannel so the sister could change her clothes. Catherine's superiors definitely recognized her extraordinary capabilities and common sense because in 1836, at the age of 30, she was given the important position of being in charge of the elderly men at Anyun and running the little farm attached to the hospice. Catherine loved this because it reminded her of her childhood on the Labore farm, and she enjoyed feeding the chickens and milking the cows. Though not officially given the title, she was assistant superior at both the hospice and the nearby house of charity of Ruyi, which shared a common superior and chapel. For the next 10 years, Catherine's daily routine remained virtually unchanged. She cared for the aged residents in her charge, irascible and difficult as some of them were, with unflinching devotion, patience, compassion, and kindness. She already had experience dealing with these sorts of men at her brother's restaurant. It must have occurred to Catherine 
that the time she had spent as a waitress had served a divine purpose after all in preparing her to deal with the men at Angyan. As she had done for most of her life, Catherine served meals, mended clothes, nursed the sick, comforted the dying, and kept everyone content and everything running smoothly. For those who are caregivers to the elderly, Catherine serves as a shining example and steadfast source of help and inspiration. Catherine followed St. Vincent's own counsel that no religious exercise, not even Mass, should come before the needs of the sick or poor. She was so devoted to her charges that she would turn down invitations to festivals and other diversions, saying, These are good for the young sisters, but I have to care for my old men. She always took time out, however, for spiritual conferences and retreats, knowing she needed these to feed and sustain her soul. She insisted that her old men receive the best of food in generous quantities. On her feast day, one of the men stood up at the end of the meal and announced, Sister Catherine, you are very good to us, and at table you always ask, have you had enough? Yet she did not spoil her charges. She ruled the house with a firm but loving hand. Some of the old men would return drunk after their weekly day out. Catherine would put them promptly to bed, carrying away their clothes and hiding them for the next three days, and these men would not be allowed their next day out. But when another sister once reproached her for not being stern enough with a particular offender, Catherine replied, I can't help it. I keep seeing Christ in him. She did, however, dutifully reprimand him the next morning. The one virtue that seemed to shine most brightly in Catherine was her purity. Her sister Tonine once said of Catherine, she did not know evil. Many who knew her believed that it was because of her extraordinary chastity that Mary chose her to be the recipient of the apparitions. Thus, the greatest trial Catherine faced was caring for those men in her charge whom she knew to be impure. Revulsion would engulf her, and it took a supreme effort of will, made possible by prayer, for her to see Christ in even the foulest of her charges. In this way, she was able to control her feelings and care for them with tenderness and compassion. With great charm and grace, she was able to melt the hearts of even the most hardened sinners. Even though she had entered the religious life, Catherine never lost her deep love of family and warmly welcomed the frequent visits of her brothers and their families who lived in Paris. Tonine married in 1858 and also moved nearby, renewing with Catherine the close sisterly relationship they had shared in earlier years. When Tonine later died after a long and painful illness, Catherine was at her bedside. Catherine was also able to be at the deathbed of her brother Jacques, lovingly placing a miraculous medal around his neck. At the request of Father Allardel, in 1841, Catherine wrote out her first complete account of the apparitions. She also entreated Father Allardel to have an altar built on the spot of the apparitions and to have a commemorative statue made of the first phase of the apparition of November 27th for Our Lady with the globe in her hands to be placed on the altar. Although Father Allardel made a tentative start on this matter, he did not follow through, much to Catherine's perpetual dismay. In 1842, the dramatic and well-publicized conversion attributed to the miraculous medal of Alphonse Radisbon, a vehemently anti-Catholic banker, resulted in Rome's official recognition of the medal. There is no doubt that the apparition of 1830 and the subsequent outpouring of devotion to the Immaculate Conception because of the medal had a great bearing on the solemn declaration by Pope Pius IX in 1854 of the Doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is a doctrine of the Church 
that refers to the condition that the Virgin Mary was free from original sin from the first moment of her conception in the womb of her mother, St. Anne. When, in 1858, news reached Catherine about the apparition of Our Lady to Bernadette Subiru at Lourdes, she exclaimed, You see, it is our own Blessed Mother, the Immaculate. Although Catherine had told Father Allardel in 1830 that the Blessed Virgin wished to establish a confraternity of children of Mary, he did not act on this until 1835, when he petitioned Rome about it. In 1847, the Children of Mary was officially established, soon spreading worldwide. Although for reasons of secrecy, Catherine did not connect herself with the confraternity, she welcomed and encouraged each new member of the Children of Mary and Rui. Always concerned with the souls of the young, she often spent time with the neighborhood children. In 1860, 37-year-old Sister Jeanne Duf became superior of Ruyi and Engin. Because she and Catherine were alike in many ways, practical, capable, but stubborn and quick-tempered, there was a natural antipathy between them from the start. But as Sister Duff herself was to later admit, Catherine was able to conquer her flashes of temper immediately, while Sister Duff had to struggle long and hard with hers. Because there was always the suspicion among the community that Catherine was the sister of the apparitions, Sister Duff may have felt it her duty to keep Catherine humble. She did not dislike Catherine, but usually neglected her, treating her with indifference and little appreciation. She often reprimanded Catherine unfairly for trivialities, even in front of the other sisters. Yet, Catherine always held her tongue, remaining humble and obedient, which, given her natural tendencies, required great strength of character. On April 25, 1865, the 35th anniversary of Catherine's first vision of St. Vincent's heart, Father Aladel died of a stroke, and Father Etienne succeeded him as Catherine's confessor. Five years later, France once again suffered terribly from yet another change in government following the Franco-Prussian War. Our Lady's prediction in 1830 of the horrors that would occur in 40 years now came to pass. The houses of Rouilly and Angen were caught in the thick of it, but once again they were protected as Our Lady had promised. When peace returned to France, peace settled also upon Catherine's soul in these her final years. She no longer had to dread the dire events prophesied by Our Lady as she had for the past 40 years. Her country and her religious community had come through it safely. Catherine was now growing old and her body was beginning to wear down. Although she certainly did not fear death and no doubt looked forward to seeing the Virgin again in the next life, she did not have the great desire for death that some other saints had. Despite severe arthritis of the knees, asthma, and cardiovascular disease, she carried out all her duties to the best of her ability, knowing in her wise way that this was all God expected of anyone. But gradually, her superiors eased her workload and assigned assistance to her some of whom, ironically, caused Catherine more trouble than the work itself had. One lay helper, being mentally unstable, was so difficult that Catherine was the only one who would tolerate her. Despite the woman's cruel attitude toward her, Catherine refused to have her dismissed because she knew the woman would not find employment anywhere else. In 1874, Catherine was relieved of her position as custodian, and Sister Tongi was chosen to succeed her, receiving the title of Assistant Superior of Ruhi and Angin, a title Catherine had never been granted, despite having done the job for 38 years. This was hard for Catherine, especially since she did not particularly like Sister Tongi. Catherine, however, not only practiced charity toward her, but when asked her feelings about Sister Tongi's appointment, she replied, Our superiors have spoken, 
And that should be sufficient for us to receive Sister Tangi as an angel from heaven. In May of 1876, perhaps realizing that she had not much longer to live, Catherine decided to make a last attempt to have the statue of Our Lady of the Globe made. Her failure to accomplish this task all those years was one of the greatest crosses of her life. But now she needed the help of both Father Bohr, current Superior General of the community, and of Sister Superior Duf. This meant that Catherine had to break her silence of 46 years and reveal to them her identity as the Sister of the Apparitions. She did this after praying and receiving Our Lady's permission. Sister Duff set the wheels in motion by hiring a sculptor, Frock Robert, to begin work on the statue. Not surprisingly, upon seeing the finished plaster model, Catherine exclaimed in disappointment, Ah, the Blessed Virgin was much more beautiful than that. Nevertheless, Catherine had finally accomplished her one remaining mission, and now she told everyone that she would not live to see the new year. Despite their disbelief, she insisted with a smile, You'll see. Throughout her religious life, Catherine had predicted many events which later came to pass. But oddly enough, none of her fellow nuns seemed to recognize the significance of this extraordinary gift. As the year wore on, she became sicker and weaker. Although she still went out occasionally, she found herself confined to bed with increasing frequency. It was at this time that Father Chevalier, her new confessor, requested that Catherine write once again a full account of her visions. This last account agreed in every detail with the accounts of 1841 and 1846. On December 31, 1876, Catherine was feeling well enough to receive a visit from her niece Marie, during which she gave Marie a miraculous medal, the last of her supply of the original ones. When Marie left, she told Catherine she would stop by in the morning to wish her a happy new year. But Catherine replied, I shall not be here. Shortly after 6 p.m., she took a turn for the worse. The sisters gathered around her to say the prayers for the dying, and at 7 p.m., Catherine Labore went peacefully to join her beloved Heavenly Mother. At supper that evening, Sister Doof read to the enthralled community Catherine's account of the visions. The exciting news that Catherine had indeed been the sister of the apparitions, as many had suspected, soon spread beyond the convent to the whole city. Catherine's funeral was held on January 3, 1877, and she was laid to rest in a vault beneath the chapel at Ruyi, as she herself had predicted several weeks earlier. A few days after the funeral, the first cure attributed to Catherine Labore occurred. A ten-year-old boy, who had been paralyzed since birth, was totally restored to health after touching Catherine's tomb. In 1895, a petition was submitted to Rome for a feast day in honor of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal, and shortly thereafter, the cause for the beatification of Sister Catherine Labore was also begun. After a long period of research into Catherine's life, she was beatified on May 28, 1933. As is customary, at this time, the body of Blessed Catherine was exhumed. It was found to be as fresh and incorrupt as on the day she was buried. Catherine Labore was canonized on July 17, 1947. At the close of the ceremony, Pope Pius XII said of her, Favored though she was with visions and celestial delights, she did not advertise herself to seek worldly fame, but took herself merely for the handmaid of God and preferred to remain unknown and to be reputed as nothing. And thus, desiring only the glory of God and of His Mother, she went meekly about the ordinary and even the unpleasant tasks that were assigned to her. And while she worked away, never idle but always busy and cheerful, 
Her heart never lost sight of heavenly things. Indeed, she saw God uninterruptedly in all things and all things in God.